Hello, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to my live garden class. Let me just give a few more seconds for other people to join. I kind of had some technical <laughs> difficulties at the beginning and so I'm a, a couple minutes late. Um, but usually I start at 6.30 on the dot with my live uh, garden classes. Today's topic is showing you my garden before I plant it up. I really wanted to show you guys the structures that I build, kind of like how I organize this, how I plan it. Hello from Colorado. Um, and if you're new here, my name is Jara. I teach people how to garden with an emphasis on pretty much growing food because that's my favorite part of it. I also raise backyard chickens and I'm a beekeeper. So I post about these things almost on a daily basis on my YouTube channel. And I've been doing live classes periodically. It just depends on my schedule. Um, this is part of my fall garden series. So today, like I said, the topic is showing you the bare bones before I plant all this up. So you guys can see that this doesn't just magically happen. There's a lot of hard work that goes into this. Hello from St. Cloud. And um, normally I go live on YouTube and TikTok, but because I'll be moving around in the garden today, it's really hard for me to have two phones on two tripods. So I told my TikTok people, I'm really sorry, but I'm just gonna do YouTube today. Um, hello from St. Cloud, I'm about 25 minutes from you. That's where I have my second garden. This is my home garden. Um, so it's very small, I live in an HOA neighborhood. I'm very limited on what I could do, but I still grow lots of things back here. Um, I have a second garden in St. Cloud, Florida on my aunt's property. That's where I have my chickens and the bees and all of that kind of stuff because this is an HOA community here. And we have a, a big garden there as well and the family kind of meets with me there and we work on things together. So, um, But this garden is just me. <laughs> I'm the only one that manages and takes care of this thing. So I do have a couple things that I put in place to make it easier on me to help me be more efficient which in turn helps me have more time to grow more and expand my garden and make sure I can maintain it and keep up with it but um, today this weekend is a big deal because this is when I'm planting up my fall garden if you've been following um, my classes I started in July and every time we met the topic was about starting seeds for different things the first class was about starting seeds for um, tomatoes peppers that kind of thing um, now we're two months later and all my tomatoes and things are ready to be planted. Um, the last class we talked about um, sowing seeds for brassicas and that kind of thing. Those things are going to be ready to be uh, transplanted in October. So that's when I plan to do the next class sometime in October where I show you guys how I plant those things. So every class is something different. Um, I don't know how dark it's going to get back here or what. It's the first time I'm <laughs> out here so forgive me. And um, if you can't hear me very good or it looks kind of weird, just let me know. On my end, it looks okay, but I don't know what it looks like for you guys. Um, so yeah, today, um, this whole weekend, I've been clearing this entire section out. I was solarizing this entire area for about two months during my summer because I was starting to have a lot of issues with um, like bacterial wilts or viruses. Viruses also cause wilting with my tomatoes specifically um, last fall um, every fall I usually plant up a huge amount of tomatoes and I do a second round um, in January because <laughs> I'm in Florida and I can I'm growing tomatoes in January so um, that first set in fall was destroyed I got hit two hurricanes back to back um, the first one I got so much flooding back here that my tomatoes i could see them wilting day by day one by one by one by one so that tells me that it was either it was a wilt by either a bacteria or a virus that lives in the soil and it was spreading slowly making its way through and like killed everything um, and those kinds of things the only way to get rid of it really is solarizing um, and well when a hurricane comes and dumps that amount of water on your soil 
that also helps those bacteria and bad pathogens, whatever, spores, funguses, molds, all those things to proliferate and spread. So that water also helped it spread and it started hitting the line of my tomatoes one by one by one. So I lost all of those tomatoes and the flooding and root rot also contributed to that. Um, the other, then I replanted and I got hit by another hurricane and it killed off the second um, planting of tomatoes. So that was the worst year I've ever had for my tomatoes. Everything else survived. So that really tells me those tomatoes are really affected because of those bacteria and stuff like that. Um, because all, all the other crops, the broccoli, the greens, stuff that I had back here right next to the tomatoes were fine. Um, another thing you might notice is that I'm using black um, weed blocking material. Last year I had the entire area covered in this stuff and that is to help me out to keep up with the weeding because it's insane here in Florida. Um, I'm starting my garden now in September after a really long, hot, rainy summer and the weeds just get out of control. It is, it's a lot. So this has helped me save so much time. Last year the whole thing was covered up, which I think kind of made the situation worse with all the rains and the hurricane because it was like the soil couldn't evaporate as well. So I'm leaving some spaces open now. That's where I will be planting. So I just decided to put the black plastic over the sections where um, like my walkways and things like that. So that will help the soil kind of breathe a little bit. And I'm hoping that the solarization killed or at least reduced um, the populations of, you know, those diseases and things, nematodes even, if that's what's going on here. I haven't found nematodes here, but I am starting to see it in the other side of my garden in those beds really bad. Um, I've been here for seven years. I've never really dealt or noticed the nematodes, um, but this year was the most, the hottest year in the world, I think on record for the world, right? So nematodes thrive in the heat and the rain and I really think that's what's happening. And so if you have it in one bed, it's pretty safe to assume you just have it everywhere. So, um, you know, that's, that's again why I decided to solarize. So I'm hoping that will help mitigate a lot of those issues. Uh, for the nematodes, there's other things that I will be doing. Um, every time I'm planting something in my garden, I put a handful of crab meal in the planting hole because crab meal is um, broken up shells, right? And that's pure chitin, if I'm saying that correctly, the components of the shell, right? What it's made out of and that attracts beneficial nematodes. They eat the chitin and therefore they will eat, they also eat the bad nematodes. So you wanna attract good nematodes to your garden. That's probably the most effective thing that you can do without getting real heavy in some chemicals and like dousing your soil in um, different types of chemicals to help control the nematodes. That also kills the beneficial ones as well. And I'm sure just, I try, I try to be as organic as possible. So I really don't wanna go that route but I'm definitely gonna be putting crab meal into every single planting hole. Um, I want to start, you can actually buy like these little packages of beneficial nematodes. You break it up, put it in water, and you kind of, um, you know, drench your soil. Not, not a fertilizer, but it's a way to inoculate your soil, so to speak, with beneficial nematodes. So that's what I'm gonna concentrate on really heavily this fall and um, I really won't know if I have a nematode problem back here unless my plants are just not thriving as expected or if I'm cleaning out the garden and I yank something out and I notice the roots are all knotted and everything. When you notice that, it's a, that's a clear classic sign that you have nematodes. There's no mistaking it. So I was cleaning up the other side of my garden, pulled stuff out, saw the roots. It, it was horrible and I, you just know you have it, right? So that's probably one of the worst things that you can deal with. Um, it mostly affects people in the southern parts of the United States where we don't get cold enough winters to kill the nematodes in the soil. So that's you people up north where it snows, your ground freezes, you don't have to deal with nematodes like we do here in the south. And nematodes affects everything, every flowers, edible crops, trees, like everything. It's, it really sucks when you have this type of issue in your garden. Um, so the best thing is to just try your hardest to solarize, put beneficial nematodes in there, um, try planting things that are resistant to nematodes. Most of the time that's a lot of hybrid stuff. 
and I really enjoy growing my heirlooms, but I'm also experimenting with some hybrids this year um, because just trying to mix it up and again, kind of reduce um, anything that would attract um, nematodes to my garden. So also crop rotation is really, really important. Um, I have a small garden, so what I do is like half of it will be tomatoes one year, the other half won't, it'll be a different crop, right? Um, and then I have the other side of my garden. So I kind of have three areas where I can kind of rotate things. Uh, but like I said, I just think this year that heat is just causing these things to thrive. I've also have an enormous amount of squash bugs and stink bugs this year that I've never dealt with before. And those are really tough. Um, also a lot of mealy bugs too. So I don't know, everyone says they're experiencing different things in their gardens this year that are just making it kind of extra tough. Let me check my um, chat here on YouTube. You have to hit it um, to make it pop up. Um, if you guys have any questions for me as I go along, um, you know, just let me know your zone and where you're located so I can kind of accurately answer that. But if you guys are with me from the beginning, the first class where, um, or maybe the second class where we uh, sowed seeds for the warm weather crops that you wanted to get one more harvest in before your first uh, average winter frost, um, we sowed all these seeds together, or well, I did some of it online um, with you guys. And so I've got, you know, seminal pumpkins right here. These are really big. Um, I can tell they're starting to get a little bit yellow, which means they're getting um, root bound. So they really got to go into the ground as soon as possible. Um, but really my, my goal for this weekend is getting all of my tomatoes planted up. And so these tomatoes are hitting, um, let's see, I started them on, July 13th so they're probably hitting six or seven weeks which is usually for me the sweet spot for um, planting uh, the tomatoes and just to show you what they look like um, this is a dwarf tomato variety so it's much shorter and thicker um, stems but this is this is ready to go um, this is a sunrise bumblebee it's a cherry tomato so much longer um, and it's gonna be thinner cherries have much thinner stems than like a beefsteak or something like that but this size is, is what you're going for. Um, let me see what else I have in here. Neves Azorian Red is a big beefsteak um, heirloom. She's ready to go as well. Now, the thing with um, tomatoes, it's a little bit different um, when you plant tomatoes versus any other crop, really. The tomatoes are very unique. <laughs> um, you want to bury half the stem when you plant your tomatoes. So you're going to make this deep hole so that you could bury half of this stem here. I like to put different kinds of fertilizers and nutrients and stuff into that planting hole, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and you bury half your stem because wherever this stem makes contact with the soil, it will cause roots to, to grow out of there and form. And the bigger the root system, the more vigorous your tomato plant, the more it's gonna produce, you know, so that's, that's really important with tomatoes. Um, if you notice these little white nodules forming at the stem, um, don't freak out, that's completely normal. That's just root um, development. Um, sometimes it forms like these little bumps on there. That is completely normal uh, for tom tomatoes. Actually, you can kind of see it <laughs> right here. I don't know if you guys could see on this one, those little hairy white spots right there. That That's normal root development. Um, if I, you know, make this touch the ground, it will definitely grow a lot of roots. Sometimes it doesn't, it just hangs there like that. That's completely fine and normal. Um, so yeah, so these are all uh, my tomatoes, but let me get, give you guys kind of a tour of what I have going on back here. Some of the structures I build because I really, really like vertical gardening as, as much as possible because being here in the south, the humidity, the rain, um, the heat and everything, the pests like devour your plants. So if you're able to vertical garden and pick those plants up off from the ground, you're making it harder for the pests to get on them. Plus it also improves air circulation. You want your leaves to be as dry as possible to prevent um, diseases, spread of diseases and different things like that. So Vertical gardening is a must for me. It also helps me achieve my organic gardening goals because therefore I don't need to be spraying with, you know, whatever treatments to control all of these different things. I pretty much only use two kinds of sprays in my garden. Um, one is to control worms and sometimes mealy bugs. 
and that would be um, BT, BT spray, that stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, I talk about it all the time. That is just for worms um, and any kind of insect that chews leaves, they have to chew those leaves to ingest it to for it to work. So therefore it's very safe, it doesn't really harm bees, butterflies, it can't harm their caterpillars, so do not spray any butterfly host plants um, with BT or anything. But um, BT is my, my go-to thing. If it's a really tough worm, like um, the corn ear worm that attacks my corn plants, or a soft-bodied insect like aphids, um, mealybugs, you can use spinosad instead, which is similar to BT. It's not um, a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's some other like fermented kind of product thing. But um, it also has the added benefit of killing on contact. So if it's a soft-bodied insect, it would work pretty well against that. And that, that's it. Those are the two things that I will use. Um, and then for the, the leaf diseases and stuff like that, I just spray with one cup of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water. That's it. Hydrogen peroxide kills pathogens. So it cleans and disinfects um, the surfaces of my leaves. And literally, I can see um, the powdery mildew, the blights, whatever, kind of just halting and stop. They dry up and kind of die. Um, uh, I've had people tell me that hydrogen peroxide kills, um, like the good bacterias and stuff in the soil. I'm, I'm sure it does, or it can, but I'm not dousing my soil in hydrogen peroxide. I have a mist, light mister type of spray, and I'm spraying just the plant, like the leaves of the plant. It's not like falling and dripping and soaking up my soil. So I think it's fine. Um, it dries up pretty quickly. I'm pretty sure it deteriorates very quickly in the environment. It's not something that's just going to wash down to the ground. So I've been using it for years to each, your, to each their own. <laughs> I don't like to use neem because it's so hot here that it, any kind of oil based product will burn my leaves. I've had that happen before, but I know a lot of people in Florida and the South use neem. So if it works for you, definitely use it. But I, I feel better with the hydrogen peroxide. And let me just check my comments here. Um, will I use shade cloth when planting in this heat? I've never used shade cloth. I'm just too lazy to install all of that. But because this year was record breaking heat that I've never seen before, um, my plants were struggling even more <laughs> than what they normally do during the summer. Um, I might decide to experiment finally with some shade cloth, but that would be um, the next summer that's coming. Uh, right now, I'm going into fall. I garden. That, that's actually the prime time gardening time for me is fall through winter and spring. It doesn't snow here. My ground doesn't freeze. I grow everything, right? It's kind of the opposite for those of you that are in a state north of me where it snows and stuff. Your optimal prime time would be spring, summer, and fall. So mine's kind of like the opposite. But hey, if you're following me and watching me, then you get great ideas so that you can plan ahead and start planting your spring garden. So whatever I'm doing now is probably what you do in the spring. So you can start planning and um, get ahead. Um, but I've I've never used um, shade cloth and kind of more so as well because during the summer, I strategize and really plant things that are very heat tolerant, uh, tropical stuff that aren't don't really struggle that that much. You know, with that kind of high heat, they're okay. But I would love to see and experiment how my tomatoes and peppers do with some shade cloth. I cannot grow tomatoes during the summer. It's just way too hot. They have issues pollinating. Um, if you're in Florida, do not grow tomatoes in the summer. It's not a summer crop for, for us. Um, it's When it's high heat, even if you can get that plant to survive and keep the pests and diseases off from it, at high heat, it damages the pollen and the pollen also cannot float around like normal to properly pollinate and produce fruit. So you might just notice the flowers are drying up and just falling off, or it even stunts the plants. Like they're not really growing much, not, you know, doing anything. That is all heat related. So maybe with some shade cloth, it might keep the temperature down a little bit to where they might survive, they might produce. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I'll have to experiment and see how it goes, but it, you know, I would much rather just not grow tomatoes during the summer and have to build a whole shade cloth thing and all of that just to grow some tomatoes when I can grow something else that will produce food for me but that won't need all those things <laughs> okay it's used to the heat it's something tropical thrives in those conditions anyways and honestly during the summer this year was it was so hot 
it was the first year where I shut down half of my garden. I was like, I'm not even, I'm not even going out there. <laughs> so I solarized and I kind of liked that approach um, because there's not as many things as I can grow during the summer. Some things will, I can still grow some things, but it's a much smaller garden, so to speak, or quantity of plants. So I can shut down half of my garden, maintain a one half growing that super tropical heat tolerant kind of things and you know kind of maybe shut down the garden solarize take advantage of that heat to to solarize and do other things um but anyways let me let me just <laughs> open up the chat here i hate how youtube makes you do that on tiktok you don't have to oh thank you for confirming that you can um hear me okay um you have millipedes on the surface you're in zone 10a in florida and you have millipedes on the surface of your raised bed there's tons of them uh, it disappeared. Are they a problem? Um, I'm going to say they're not a problem. Uh, I have tons of millipedes as well. I don't know what kind you have. Mine are like this long or so, and they're kind of like a coppery brown color. Um, I get a lot of those, and I get some that are like smaller. They're black, and they kind of have like white striping on it or something. Um, those millipedes and stuff like that decompose things in your soil right they're like earthworms you know they eat stuff and help decompose and whatever so they're usually attracted to decomposing matter and they don't bother my plants i've never noticed them bothering my plants so i guess question for you because maybe you don't have the same kind of centipedes or whatever that i do in my garden monitor your plants are they on your plants are they chewing them up or whatever it is that they do if not leave them alone they're part of the beneficial insect um uh, ecosystem biology whatever of your garden so so far I've never had a problem with you know centipedes millipedes or anything like that all right guys so I'm gonna um, take the camera off the tripod here kind of show you around um, what I've been building um, this whole weekend um, and I do this all by myself by the way um, so I'm always looking for the easiest way to do these things or to build things so that I can do it by myself and I don't have to bother people to come help me or whatever. Um, so all these structures and things that I build, um, I, as a female that knows nothing about tools, if I can do it, so can you. Okay, so I just find easy, easy ways to do things. So this is um, the entrance right here, side of my house. Um, I'm still cleaning things out because the weeds are insane and I haven't, I didn't even want to come out here to weed or nothing this, this whole summer, basically. So um, now that things are cooling, I'm coming back out here, cleaning things out, getting it ready. But this is um, a cattle pa panel trellis, but it's not cattle panels because I don't have a big truck or whatever or a means of transporting an actual cattle panel uh, piece to my garden. So what I did instead is my aunt had a couple rolls of this really, I don't know the gauge of it, um, but it's very thick. And sturdy um, metal here she had a couple rolls of this um, just in her back of her property not using it and I took it and brought it home so I'm sure you can find this is some kind of fencing uh, material for I'm sure cattle or goats or something so if you go to like Home Depot or tractor supply I'm sure you can find something similar in a roll that you could just load that very easily into your car it is four foot wide um, just like the cattle panels I believe no, actually, maybe the cattle panels are five foot. I'm not sure. Um, but it's four foot wide, really sturdy. Um, I get these T-posts. So my garden is pretty much made of T-posts and zip ties, practically. So no tools required except for your T-post driver. So I drive in um, a T-post here. I use zip ties to attach this um, cattle panel. Or I'm going to say cattle panel, even though it's not technically cattle panel, but that's what I'm going to call it, right? cattle panel arch trellis so my plan with this I put four of them in a row together so that's 16 feet here I would have kept going but I have this I know it looks really bad and straggly right now that's a kale plant that's been in my garden for two years now that's amazing and it survived all those hurricanes and everything um, so I I dare not cut that thing down or remove it it looks really horrible right now because it just went through summer but it usually perks back up and you know once the temperatures drop down and it, it's lush it has multiple branches this is um black um tuscan also known as lacinato or dinosaur kale that is the number one kale i recommend if you're in a hot climate 
grow that one. That's the best one I've ever experimented with so far. So she's right in the middle at the end of my cattle panel trellis and she will stay there. I'm not gonna touch her. So this is very easy to assemble. Um, you just drive in a couple T-posts, four for each panel, connect them all with some zip ties and you've got a very sturdy um, trellis system. This has survived through hurricanes, like no problem. And I know I say hurricanes really weird. I don't know, that's how I say it. My family's Dominican, I grew up learning English with them or whatever. Um, so I say hurricanes, but anyways, uh, this is very sturdy. It'll last, um, through hurricane. If you're on the coast though, I don't know how you guys do it. I, I honestly don't know how you do it. You get hit by a hurricane every single year for sure. I'm in central Florida. So hurricanes, the chances of one coming up through the middle of our state is very unlikely. Um, last year just so happened to be a bad luck year, I guess, because we got two of them. But it's very unlikely for um, the chances of one coming through is very unlikely. And by the time it does, it has significantly weakened. It's not a category three or four. Um, but uh, I think last year we got hit by a three, though. And this this survived, okay? I did get flooding in here. Not terrible flooding like where it came in my house or anything. But, the you know, everything was pretty flooded. It was pretty bad back here. Um, so this will withstand. Uh, it's pretty solid. Now moving along, um, sorry guys, holding, holding this by hand is um, not the most comfortable thing. Actually, you know what? Sometimes I don't think I should put it on the tripod and hold the tripod. <laughs> That's much, much better. Um, so anyways, let me just check the chat really quick. Okay. So that is a super simple, easy, very affordable, last forever um, way to build a very large trellis system. And my plan for this um, system here is to plant my indeterminate uh, tomatoes here. So I do have this black plastic here. This is my walkway, but you might notice this little sliver. It's probably less than one foot um, long here or wide. That's where I'm going to plant my tomatoes so that the soil can breathe. It won't be blocked by this black material here. Um, and that's where I'm gonna plant all my tomatoes. And I plant my tomatoes very densely, one foot apart. Yes, one foot apart. <laughs> and that is for indeterminates. Um, let me read your message here. Uh, just put up an arch trellis. I'm putting tomato and cucumber near it, but are there any other climbing things good for fall? There's so many things you can plant right now. Um, definitely, if you can, any kind of pole or vining um, bean. If you plant them right now, you'll be harvesting tons of fresh green beans in time for Thanksgiving. And I have a, I just posted, um, yeah, on Friday, my September monthly garden guide on YouTube. It's, it, it explains everything that you could possibly start from seed or transplant during the month of September. I do this for every single month. So um, I started it in March of this year, so I don't have every month yet, so I'm going along. But the one for September is there, and that'll give you tons of ideas for things that you can plant right now. Oh, <laughs> that's a little lizard came running out. Um, so yeah, I would definitely do cucumbers, um, any of these smaller, like squashes, uh, your tomatoes, uh, yeah, anything like that you can, you can start planting here. Um, small melons as well, if you want to try, I don't know how much time you have before your first, uh, winter frost. And I'm sorry guys, the, the sun is behind me, so it causes like a weird line. It's kind of, kind of difficult here. Maybe that's a little better, but the sun's setting over here, so it's like really, really strong here. But anyway, so this is the uh, cattle panel trellis. Um, because I didn't have enough of this material to like continue with it or make it bigger, I am going to be doing um, my other way of um, trellising up my tomatoes. So this is a big line right here. As you can see, there's a T-post right here. There's another one over there. It, it's a straight line here. So with this, I'm going to string up. Let me just hold on. <laughs> let me put this better. This is hard doing it outside, guys. Wish I had um, a cameraman or something, but I don't. I do all of this myself, by the way, editing my videos, everything. I'm a one person show, OK? So um, this is the first uh, T post here. What I do is I put, I get, um, it's like double stranded uh, wire. I forget the name of it. 
I do have an Amazon um, link and there's like a trellis system uh, category, so to speak, on my Amazon link if you want to find the supplies and stuff that I use. But anyways, it's like a double stranded or quadruple st stranded wire that's pretty flexible. I wrap it around here, string it, wrap it around the next um, T post and keep stringing it to just put one wire across the top here. Um, and then from here, I have um, a tomato, it's like a hook system. So it's like a spool of some string and it has a, a hook so it just hangs right on that wire. And then at the end of that string that I removed from the spool, I wrap that around the main leader stem of my indeterminate tomatoes. Or sometimes I have two main leader stems. So then I'll have two spools for that plant, right? So that helps me maintain the long um, leader stem of the indeterminate forever until that plant dies because that's where it's going to set fruit on the ends of the vines. It'll flower there, set fruit, grow some more, flower there, set some fruit, grow some more until the, the plant dies at the end of your season, which for me is when summer arrives. That's the end of my tomato season. So um, I really like this system. The first time I tried it was last fall. I have YouTube videos about it if you want to see, um, you know, how that works, how it, everything attaches. But it's a spool with a string and you can unclip it and just kind of move it horizontally as the season progresses and your tomatoes get longer. So you maintain those tips, the tips of those vines. You don't need to prune them off because you ran out of space vertically, that kind of thing. Um, so that's what I'm going to be using here. I'm going to string this um, wire across, plant my tomatoes one foot apart, um, and maintain them on one or maybe two main leader vines. That's how I'm able to grow so many tomatoes in a small garden, all right? Um, you have to stay on top of your pruning with that, okay? Because if you don't, again, this affects more us Southerners <laughs> that have very high disease um, and bug pressure. If you don't prune your tomato plants, it makes that whole situation worse. Okay, so pruning and keeping them clean really helps me not have to spray with stuff as much and, and whatever. Okay, if you're in a state north of me, you don't have that much of a problem with all the diseases and pests. You still have some, but we're on another level here in Florida. Okay, um, we're the Australia of the United States, so everything here is... Um, they just multiply like overnight and eat everything. It's insane. So that um, pruning your tomato plants really helps a lot with that. If you're up north where you get some, but it's not like here, you can relax a little bit on your pruning because you are you don't have those kinds of issues as much. But definitely if you're going to grow tomatoes, especially in Florida or in the south, you're going to attract everything, every bug, every um, disease you really got to maintain it nice and clean or you, it just it's not going to work you're just now growing a plant that's a host for all of these bad things that are going to come into your garden because it finds your tomato plants so um i think tomatoes are a higher level type of crop so if you're a beginner gardener i i actually recommend you don't do tomatoes <laughs> Um, if you definitely want to, start with a cherry tomato. They're more vigorous. They're more resistant to things. They start producing earlier, um, which is good because that means most likely you'll harvest something before your plant dies. Um, whereas a beefsteak or something like that takes much longer time to start producing and for that fruit to be ready for harvest, which is more time and opportunity for things to go wrong or pests or whatever to kill your plants. So if you're a beginner, start with a cherry um and get some of those basic tomato growing skills in place before you move on to the harder stuff like the uh, beef steaks or whatever so anyway so these are two different ways that i am um trellising up my tomatoes so i have these arch um cattle panel thingies um and by the way all these things that i'm talking about are for indeterminate tomatoes if you're planting determinates which i am also planting some determinates you don't have to worry so much about the whole pruning and um, you know the trell having huge trellis systems because determinants they they top off at about I don't know four to five feet max then they set all their fruit at once you harvest it all and that's pretty much it like the plant might linger might produce like a second crop but it's not as good as that first crop 
And that's the whole point of growing the determinants is to get a quick crop. So during the fall, I like to start growing the determinants because I know winter's coming and I have less time um, to grow out and harvest everything before winter arrives. And by the way, just to give you an idea, um, my first cold frost is the very last week of December. <laughs> so I have plenty of time, but it, to be more successful, to grow the most food possible, growing determinants during the fall, I think is the smarter choice. Um, but I still have some indeterminates that I want to experiment with that I just absolutely love. So I'm growing some in there mixed with the determinants. Now the determinants, since they're shorter, bushier kind of plants, um, you don't have to stay on top of pruning. You don't, you don't want to prune them because then you're taking off its points where it's going to flower and produce fruit. So you don't want to um, prune them off. So if you're looking for something easier than the heirloom indeterminate beefsteak type things, go with the determinate. You don't have to prune. You still got to check for the bugs and diseases though, but no pruning. You don't need a big um, system to support them. I'm going to use more of like a Florida weave type of method, which works really great in between these T posts here. Um, the Florida weave is where you take string at different levels as the plant gets taller and you just weave that string between your plants and it's enough to support them to keep them up. So that works really great with determinants. Not so much within determinants. I mean, I'm sure some of you have done it, but I find that having a solid trellis or doing the wire um, with the hook and spool type of system is much better for the indeterminates. So I will be planting up um, all of these two rows right here. This is almost um, 29, 30 feet each row. So that's 60 or so feet of tomatoes. And I plant one tomato every foot. So that's a lot of tomato plants. And I'm gonna be very happy because it's my favorite um, thing to grow. So that's what's going into these uh, two rows right here. Um, over here, I have blank space and my AC just turned on guys. So sorry about that. Um, let me check my messages real quick. Um, I had cattle, cattle panels delivered by Lowe's. It was pricey, but since I was paying a fat, flat de delivery fee, I ordered 30 bags of topsoil to help. I mean, that's a great idea. Um, that is, but uh, I, I got this stuff for free, this material here, so I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I can't, can I transplant frog eggplant seedlings in the fall? Um, yes, you can transplant them for sure. To just be starting seeds for them right now, no. Um, I started seeds for tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants in July. So they're two months old by this point, and now they're ready to transplant. So if you have transplants, go ahead and plant them. But if you're just getting started with seeds, it's you kind of missed your mark. Just to give you an idea, I will be sowing seeds for all my warm weather crops like tomatoes, blah, blah, blah. The, like the first week of December to transplant them again at the end of January. And that I only recommend if you are in zones eight and up, southern parts of the United States, where... Uh, Let's see, my, fir my last average frost date is the second week of February. So by planting at the very end of January, I'm almost through my winter. That's it, That's I have a very short winter. I know some of you zone eight people definitely have a little bit longer winter than me. And some of you, your um, last uh, spring frost date falls like in March and stuff like that. So you just gotta kind of time it a little bit different. If I'm starting them in December, and I need them to be six weeks old, um, just backtrack from your last average spring frost date, six weeks, and then start your seeds indoors, again, for the warm stuff, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, just to give you an idea, okay? You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so um, one thing that I am building um, currently, it's my goal to have this installed before I start planting everything, is um, drip irrigation. So I will be doing a whole YouTube video tutorial about my drip irrigation system, how I set it up, because right now I have not started. I needed to build and have everything in place so that I know where I'm gonna be planting my crops so I know where to put my drip irrigation. That's just kind of like how I look at it. So right here I know I'm gonna be planting tomatoes, right? These two rows right here. Um, I'm planting them one foot apart. So I have drip irrigation tubing that has emitters in it every 12 inches. So that's perfect. I'm going to lay that down first before I start planting my tomatoes. 
And wherever I see a drip emitter, I'm gonna dig my hole and plant my tomato plant right there. So that's kind of how I gauge, you know, what kind of drip system I need, where I'm gonna place it and all of that. So first I need to have the infrastructure in place so I know where I'm planting things and then make my decisions on what kind of drip irrigation tubing I will use for that section. And um, I got my drip irrigation system from, it's a kit from dripdepot.com. Love it, you don't need any tools. You don't need to know about plumbing, how to install PVC, how to install a new spit gate, cut, cut uh, plastic tubing, whatever. None of that, okay? No, it's this easiest system. I installed it at my second garden already. A thousand feet of drip irrigation by myself in like an hour. It's that easy and it worked from the moment I turned it on, no problems. So I was like, this is awesome. I need to get it here at home. So I will be putting this entire side of the garden on their drip irrigation system um, and doing a YouTube tutorial, which I plan to upload that this Friday or maybe the next Friday. It just depends how quickly I'm able to edit that video. But yeah, so I'm definitely gonna be putting lines in here they sell um, drip irrigation tubing that is eight inches apart, six inches apart. So again, depending on what you're planting, you need to decide what kind of drip um, tape you need. So I also have the eight inch spacing because I like that for smaller things like um, lettuces, bok choys, tatsoys, um, some of the smaller like Napa cabbages. They do uh, better, you know, on an eight inch spacing. Um, so I have that kind of drip tape too, I'll, and I'm just going to use both of them depending on where I decide to plant all of these things. So um, here, uh, this section here is left bare because that's where I'm going to be planting a lot of things. This is going to be um, a bunch of row crops. Uh, I, I think I'm going to put all my brassicas in here when in October when they're, you know, I'm cr currently growing them out. So um, I hope by the first week of October or so that they'll be big enough to start transplanting into the garden. So I'll have a line of tomatoes here. In the middle, I'll have brassicas. And then on the edges of all of these planting areas, I'm gonna put um, onions and garlic because they're, those are small plants. So they work out really great as edger kind of plants for your raised beds, for your in-ground beds, you know, whatever. They don't take up that much space. And they also deter a lot of pests and things like that. So that the smell helps mask the smell of like your tomato plants because supposedly pests find your plants based on smell. So if you have a very strong smelling plant next to your tomato, like a basil, herbs, onions, that masks the smell of the tomatoes and kind of confuses the pests and it helps them like not find your plants. I'm not saying it works 100% of the time, but it helps um, with organic gardening and stuff like that, nothing works a hundred percent of the time, but rather having different pieces and doing different things and having it all work together is what helps keep, you know, the pests and all that kind of stuff, pressure down and all of those things. So, um, you gotta, you gotta do multiple things here. Another thing I do is I break up my crops. I don't have just full, you know, all this being broccoli or something, or all this being tomatoes. Um, I'll plant a couple tomato plants. Actually, my, with the tomatoes, they're one foot apart. Um, I'll plant, you know, a tomato here, a tomato here. And the middle is marigolds because, like I said, I'm really concerned about nematodes this year. So marigolds, um, they kill the nematodes that find their way and chew on their roots. They have a compound in their roots that kills them. So it, it doesn't mean it eliminates them from your soil. It just means if a nematode comes in, and bites it, it'll die. So it has to come in to begin with, if that makes sense. So because I'm concerned about nematodes, I am putting marigolds, one marigold in between every single tomato plant. I'm choosing a dwarf French variety of marigolds. So I actually have seeds on my website for um, the same ones I'm gonna be planting with. I have lots of different marigolds that I plant with, but because it's going in between some of my crops, I like to use the dwarf um, sizes. And I believe it's called Petite Dwarf French um, marigolds. So I'll just sprinkle in some seeds for those marigolds in between each tomato plant. They're gonna, you know, direct sow them. They grow really quickly and they will just kind of help me deter pests and nematodes if that's the issue. Let me check my chat here. It's getting dark pretty quick. Um, so yeah, 
that's what I'm going to do with the, the tomatoes that are in the slime. In the middle here, like I said, I'm going to put broccoli. I'm going to edge around with onions, garlic, that kind of thing. But in between my broccoli, I also break that up with different kinds of crops. So, um, you know, maybe I've got some peppers or some okra, um, different kind of herbs and flowers. I've got some squashes here that I need to plant. Um, it will all kind of be broken up. So that way it just helps deter those pests as much as possible. Um, so that's kind of like uh, the system here. On this side, um, I have some wood trellising. It's blue and a, a white one back there. This whole line here is dedicated to the butterflies and the bees. So I've got passion fruit vines. This is a giant yellow Brazilian passion fruit which is a host plant for the Gulf Fritillary butterfly, if I'm saying that correctly. And then I've got a um, giant Dutchman's pipe vine um, for, I believe it's some kind of polydama swallowtail butterfly or something um, like that host plant for those. I've got different kinds of milkweed in the front of those plants and salvias for the bees and, and different things. Um, I was gutting that out and getting the weeds out, so it's kind of an empty uh, canvas right now, so to speak, for me to direct sow a lot of more like milkweeds or flowers in particular. I find that the butterflies are going crazy over Tithonia, Mexican sunflower number one. They love my Mexican sunflower. And the zinnias. It's a great pollen and nectar source. I don't know if they drink pollen. I don't think they, they drink nectar. Butterflies drink nectar. It's a great nectar source for the butterflies. So you wanna check those adults into your garden and then you have to have their respective host plants so that they'll lay eggs and you'll have butterfly caterpillars here. And fall is an important time for the butterflies, especially here in Florida. They're starting to, um, the monarch butterflies are migrating down from up north. Um, they come through Florida and they go uh, to Mexico. So uh, I'm planting up like as much as I can to help support you know, the monarch butterflies. Um, and I talk about that in my September garden grow guide a lot. Um, the uh, issue with milkweeds and stuff like that. So if you want to get more ideas or kind of understand a little bit more about that, definitely check out the September monthly grow guide. So that whole section there is nothing but butterfly and bee, bee plants. Um, and I've seen an uptick in butterflies this year for sure. All different kinds that I wasn't getting before. So um, the bees are important. They obviously pollinate your plants. Um, and that will also attract a lot of beneficial insects to your garden as well. So it's just really important you don't forget about the bees and the butterflies, okay? So I will be direct sowing seeds for some of the easier to, to grow from seed flowers, zinnias, sunflowers, Mexican tithonia, alyssum, marigolds, cosmos, all of those things. They grow real quick from seed if you direct sow, and they start blooming in about two and a half to three months. So also really quick to bloom before your first um, average frost arrives. Like I said, mine's at the, the very last week of December, so I have plenty of time to be planting all of these things. Um, back there is more of a perennial edible type of situation. Um, and I think it's really important that you also focus on perennial edibles that are native to wherever you're located. Don't just be planting annual row crops, okay? For self-sufficiency, um, you want to make sure you have a couple things that are going to grow great in your garden no matter what happens and that you don't have to put so much input and care into those things just to, to make sure you have something edible at all times of the year so i have perennial edible type plants i've got fruit trees back here behind me um i'll be giving a garden tour sometime in the fall when things are really starting to grow up but uh, just things that you can count on year after year right you should be mixing that in with your annual stuff um i have from time to time uh people will like attack me because i'm growing annuals in my you know florida garden or whatever and they're very strict and they think that you should only plant native stuff native stuff in florida is not that tasty okay i i'm just gonna say it. it's not very tasty i definitely love to eat broccoli carrots um tomatoes none of that stuff is native to the united states okay that was brought from you know europe and and stuff like that but it's i always say plant what you like to eat like why are you going to plant a chaya tree which i have chaya it's a leafy edible it tastes okay it's not bad tasting i have a chaya plant way back there 
um, as part of my goals of just incorporating more perennial edible crops. But do I want to eat chaya every day? No. <laughs> okay. So do what you want in your garden always, um, despite what other people might think. But um, it is important to implement some kind of perennial edible crop. So that whole back section, I've got chaya, I have roselle, I have asparagus, because asparagus does grow in Florida, despite what a lot of people will tell you. Um, let me check my um, live chat here. It sucks that I have to pull the chat up to read it, guys, but um, should you put something under a watermelon once it starts? I had one that rotted before it was ready. Um, um, I struggle with watermelons, and I don't know why. I'll just be honest with you guys. I really, really struggle with watermelons. I've tried everything in the world except... I, I, I don't know. I have the same issue. Like... Most of the time, if a fruit doesn't continue developing, it turns brown, it dies off, is because it didn't get properly pollinated, okay? But I will go in there and I'll hand pollinate them and they still die. So I don't really know what it is. And I've tried growing all sorts of different varieties of watermelons, trying to just figure out maybe one will just grow better here in Florida than another. It's very frustrating. Um, the ultimate thing that I haven't tried yet is growing them on a mound right you, you put a mound but um on top of this black plastic here because some people are reporting that the black plastic well it does prevent backsplash of you know a lot of the bacteria, funguses blights all those things that will jump up on your plants because a lot of my watermelon plants also get i think it's blight it's just yellow blotches it turns brown starts it starts looking like the plants dying off um, it also protects the fruit from the ground, and it also prevents a lot of the pests that live in the ground. A lot of pests lay their eggs and stuff, and their pupa stages and larval stages and whatever are in the ground. They hatch and they come up. So I do notice that this black plastic is a great option when I'm growing my squashes and my zucchinis. They're much healthier. So I will plant them, like, on the edge here so the roots you can't see me very well on the edge here so the roots will go down in the soil but i will throw the leaves and the vines and everything on top of this black plastic and i've noticed that that's helped my squashes a lot just healthier not, not so much pest damage stuff like that and i know people do the same thing with watermelons so that's what i'm gonna try it also protects the fruit from being on the the ground where it will rot if it gets bacteria or dirty cracked whatever bugs get in it um, so that is my um, last ditch effort of, going, of trying to grow a watermelon. But my plan for that is spring because right now it's fall. We're going into colder weather. Spring, we're going into warmer weather. So that is better for warm weather crops <laughs> like watermelons. So I'm going to be experimenting with that kind of a setup um, come this spring. I have been successful growing some melons like cantaloupes especially the Kajari melon. That is by far my favorite. It It's a smaller, more compact vine, produces loads of these small, personal size melons that taste just like honeydew melon. And I love honeydew melon. And it, it's a world of a difference growing the Kajari melon over any other kind of melon. I know that's not a watermelon, but it's some kind of melon and I like them all. So I had seeds for Kajari melon on my website because I grew them through my summer, which says a lot because they tolerated and produced during my summer here in Florida. Um, but th they sold out. I'm, I'm out of them. I'm actually growing another crop right now. So hopefully um, it's going to be maybe a month or two before I have seeds for Kajari melons again. But um, if you're struggling, you want to grow some kind of melon, I cannot recommend the Kajari melon enough. And that one is a small personal size melon, so it's very easy to grow that up a trellis. That's how I grow mine. Um, so yeah, it's getting pretty dark <laughs> here. Um, like I said, the sun's setting over there in front of me. Um, don't really, I guess I could show you guys real quick another one of my trellis systems um, that I build. And um, super easy. Let me put this down so you guys can come along with me super easy like I said everything I do um, it has to be easy enough to where I can do it and build it myself 
So this one right here, trying to set it up. <laughs> um, this is same thing. Um, this is a T-post. This is some heavy duty mesh vinyl trellis. And I have, I get this from Amazon. This has lasted me years. I love this stuff. So if you follow my Amazon link in my bios, description, wherever, um, at the end of this class, this will upload onto my YouTube channel and in the description, I'll link it as well. But this is um, the, the mesh vinyl trellis, a T post. This is a PVC T, but you can also get the ones that are like rounded, like an L shape, because it's the end right here. And I take this, um, this is a three quarter inch electrical conduit pipe. Do not get thinner than this because then it will bend under the weight of whatever you're growing on it. But I find that the three quarter inch, this is a 10 foot um, EMT pipe. I get this from Home Depot. Um, this, this will last you forever. Like I've had this stuff for years, so it's worth the investment. But you just take um, your PVC tee and you're gonna stick the electrical conduit in this hole, right? But when you stick it in the hole, you're gonna push that pipe all the way, okay? Some people ask me, how do you get it to stay? Push that pipe in all the way because then when you set this on top of your um, T-post, -t the T-post will come in, <laughs> I'm trying to show you guys how this works. The T-post will come in and hit the pipe and it just stays there, if that makes any kind of sense. So yeah, just put it there like that. I don't even measure anything. I just set up one side kind of guess the length of this and then um uh, you know drill the other post in with my um t-post driver and then i take this mesh vinyl trellis and i weave it along this emt pipe just like you would a curtain or something very easy um this supports heavy things it supports loofah it supports tromboncino rapicante i grow beans on it cucumbers kajari melons like anything anything really this is very versatile very lightweight you can take it down put it back up move your whole garden around whatever you got to do it's withstood hurricanes like i was mentioning before these um t posts are very strong very heavy duty so that's pretty much the bulk of the things that i build in my garden on this side let me just flip the camera over here another type of trellis idea for you so I got this, um, hold on guys, hold on. I got to readjust this lattice stuff, right? Um, you know, you go into Home Depot or whatever and you buy the, the wood lattice. It's about eight foot long, four foot wide. You can get a couple of those and just prop them up with some zip ties, attach it to your, your T post here. And this is very heavy duty, sturdy stuff. This is, a uh, the giant yellow Brazilian passion fruit growing right here. It's a crazy vine. Um, you know, as a homeowner, you don't want really big plants, right? Usually, if you are you have a small garden, like I'm a small backyard gardener here, you don't want big fruit trees. You don't want big um, vining plants. Um, you want it to produce something for you, but you don't need like hundreds of pounds of avocados, so to speak. So keep yourself trimmed down and you can grow a lot or at least grow enough for your own household i have a lot of fruit trees i have two different kinds of avocados i've got four different kinds of mangoes back here i have two lychees um and citrus uh peaches nectarines um you cut your trees down to a comfortable height for you to harvest okay you're not a farm you don't have the equipment to climb up and harvest the mangoes all the way at the top so as a home backyard um, gardener, you can still plant fruit trees. Um, and I plant mine close, like six feet apart, because I'm maintaining them at a very s small, you know, pruned state to where it's easy for me to harvest. They're shorter and they take up less space. And you can just do that for the duration of the life of that fruit tree. So this little eight foot um, wood lattice, trellis, whatever, it's a little eight foot section here where I have this Brazilian um, passion fruit growing is enough for my household, right? So you can really cram in things. Um, if you take care of it, prune it, maintain it for, you know, the size of your garden and everything. So let me just check my messages here. Um, I guess uh, the last thing, um, 
we're hitting an hour here. Usually my classes, I, I go for an hour. I want to show you guys how I plant um, tomatoes because that is unlike um, any other crop that you're going to plant. Um, the number one thing I would say, let me just get my setup here first off, okay? Um, I have different supplies here that I recommend for planting um, tomatoes. One second while I grab the fertilizers and the seedlings for the tomatoes. All right. One more thing, I gotta grab my tools. All right. Let's get down here so I can show you guys this. So, no matter what you are planting, I always recommend that you put something in the planting hole, some kind of fertilizer, something to give that plant a good head start in its life, okay? I'm a big proponent of organic granular fertilizer. I use Espoma brand because that's just what I find in all my stores, but you know, use whatever brand you find. Um, this is their garden tone formulation, which works for pretty much any kind of vegetable you're gonna grow. They do have a tomato tone, which is normally the one that I use throughout my entire garden because I grow so many tomatoes, but I couldn't find it <laughs> this time. So I just grabbed the garden tone. Now the organic stuff isn't gonna burn your plants. You can't overdose your plants with the organic stuff like you can with the synthetic stuff. So I can fertilize in small doses on a weekly basis with this organic granular stuff. Um, oh, there's uh, two, fighter jets over there so. very loud sorry guys i do live kind of close to the airport so there's lots of planes over here but um yeah so i can fertilize in small doses on a weekly basis i'm talking like an eighth of a cup or something to my tomatoes to my peppers whatever in the most hungry you know nutrient hungry type of crops um that will keep the nutrient supply very consistent and available at all times for them which is very important if you're in Florida because we get so much rain that it just washes those nutrients out of the soil. So this really works great. You cannot do the same thing with the synthetic stuff. You'll risk overdosing or burning your plants. If you're gonna use a synthetic fertilizer, fine. Just you know follow whatever the directions say for sure on that package of the synthetic fertilizer. So this is uh, what we're using today. This um, just a general granular organic fertilizer for the tomatoes. Um, or anything. I'm always, you know, like I said, any planting you know, peppers, okra, um, lettuces, greens, you know, all those things, sprinkle in a little bit of some organic granular fertilizer. Now, since um, tomatoes and peppers really thrive off from potassium and phosphorus, they need nitrogen. They need some nitrogen to start putting on leafy, lush growth, right? But they need the phosphorus and the potassium for the stems and the support, um, the vigor to put on uh, flower production and fruit production. So you, at some point you wanna curb away from um, anything that's higher in nitrogen. You wanna focus more on potassium and phosphorus when they start flowering. So I cannot find a organic source of potassium and phosphorus that is cheap and uh, I guess high dose because they're very weak dose. They don't really do much in my opinion. So it's the only cases where I'll use something synthetic and that's super um, triple phosphate, I believe. This is like 18 in, in weight, 18% in weight. And this is myriad of potash for the potassium. This is 60 in weight, so to speak, of, of the fertilizer. Um, so I will put a little bit of all those things along with the granular fertilizer if you have water soluble azomite, that is awesome, awesome additive, especially for peppers. I swear it makes my pepper plants produce bigger peppers. They just really like those other minerals and micronutrients that you don't really get as much with, you know, the regular fertilizers, so to speak. So um, if you get some water soluble azomite, I highly recommend that. So anyways, I'm going to dig 
a little hole here for my tomato plant. This is just to show you guys, because this is not, not where I'm going to plant my tomatoes, but I need to show you guys how I do it. And my soil here is black. It is rich black soil. I have been composting with wood chips here since I've been living here for seven years. So the soil level has raised up a lot <laughs> significantly. Um, but there's got to be at least 12 inches, if not more, of just pure broken down uh, compost and, and wood chips. It's great stuff. Um, especially if you're in Florida and we have, you know, native sandy soil and everything. Um, wood chips are by far the best ingredient, I think. Um, and I got it from Chip Drop, which means if you've ever used Chip Drop before, they will come at random and deliver a pile of wood chips bigger than your car. Okay, it's a lot. But I will order that at least once a year because I will spend three days shoveling that stuff in a wheelbarrow, bringing it back into my garden, covering everything. Usually I do it in the fall when the weather is cold or like in December or something. Um, and just re-mulch my entire garden. And I heavily mulch under all my fruit trees, like everything, at least once a year. It's a lot of work, but it's definitely worth it. So anyways, we got our hole here. And like I said, you need to dig a deep hole for tomatoes, okay? This one right here is Rosella Crimson. This is a dwarf determinant. So it's kind of shorter than what my indeterminates look like being at around the six week mark from seed, but that's okay. You're still gonna plant, bury this half, the stem halfway, okay? So that's how deep you need your hole and uh, deep enough to be able to bury half of this stem here. So you're gonna um, put your nutrients in there first, right? So I'm gonna take a little bit of this garden tone or tomato tone, if that's what you found, sprinkle it in there. I don't measure anything, it's organic. You, you can eyeball it. So I just grab some, put it in there. Then I'm gonna take uh, the water soluble azomite. I'm gonna take these things, just sprinkle a little bit in there. Again, I don't measure, just sprinkle a little bit because this is synthetic stuff. Um, this is the phosphate and the um, phosphorus and the potassium. And put it all in there, mix it all up with the soil, and then you're gonna drop your plant in there. Okay, so your tomato. So we're gonna pop this out. And how you know? How do you know your transplant is ready to go in the garden? This is this works for anything, no matter what what you're growing: tomatoes, peppers, squash, watermelons, whatever. Um, I know that just from experience, my tomatoes are ready in about six weeks. Okay, so if you're not sure, you can gently turn the plant over, pop it out. Sometimes you'll even see roots coming out of the bottom. That's a sure sign that it's ready to be transplanted, or potted up. But I hate potting up, so I grow my um, bigger crops like the tomatoes, peppers, that kind of thing in a solo cup to begin with so I don't ever have to pot up because I don't like wasting my time potting up. Some people do, I don't, <laughs> okay? Especially when I'm growing hundreds of tomato plants a year, uh, this, this helps me save a lot of time. So just start with the bigger cup to begin with. Gently pop your plant out. You see the root system. It's pretty well developed. It's circling around you know, the container without being root bound. Root bound is when you'll see lots of like tightly bound up roots because it's been sitting in this pot for too long. You should have potted it up. Um, I, tomatoes I find are, I mean, yes, things, it's gonna be affected by being root bound, but I find they quickly like grow out of that once you plant them and it's not that big of an issue. But I do find that being root bound heavily affects anything in the brassicas family. Um, also planting anything in the brassica family too close, just kind of the plants don't get as big and uh, brassicas are your broccolis, your cauliflowers, your cabbages, stuff like that. So definitely watch those for, you know, not allowing them to be root bound. Um, but tomatoes, this is perfect. The, the development of those roots, perfect. When I dump this out, the roots are fully developed in the container that this didn't fall apart. If this falls apart, you know, it could sit in here a little bit longer and grow some more roots. So anyways, this is perfect. We're gonna pop this out, put it in our planting hole here. Man, let me drop the camera just a little bit more for you guys so you can see. <laughs> Sorry guys. 
trying to trying to give you guys the best view so you understand um so yeah we're just going to drop it in here push your dirt in you're going to bury half of that stem and don't worry about it even if it looks like an itty bitty plant when you're done um you know burying it it's fine that's this is the way you need to grow your tomatoes so now anywhere where the soil is touching the stem here that that's going to start sprouting and growing roots which means a bigger root system, which means more vigorous plant and it produces more. So only for tomatoes though. I can't think of another crop that you actually bury half the stem, um, maybe like sweet potatoes, that kind of thing. But I can't think of another crop where you would do this. Anything else, you're obviously gonna plant it so that it's at the same level with the soil. Um, anything else, I also add probably the similar type of fertilizers too. I always, always, always fertilize um, any seedlings, any transplants, anything like that. Um, They're planting holes. Um, all right, I'll take that out later um, gently because I don't want it to fall apart. I want to plant it more here on this line with um, my trellis system and everything. Um, okay, so let me check. You guys have any questions for me? It's very hard being live out here. Um, do you ever recommend using booster blooms or organic fertilizer? Um, yeah, that, that is a great option for when, when you notice that your tomatoes, peppers, whatever, are starting to flower, that's the key indicator that you need to switch to fertilizers heavier in phosphorus and potassium and lean back a little bit on the nitrogen. So those bloom boosting fertilizers do just that. They focus on those two nutrients um, so that you get more blooms, whether that be on your veggie crops or actual flowers or roses or whatever. Um, the fertilizers are all the same. They're basically the same. Um, they just have different levels of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Let's say you don't have any rose bloom or flower bloom fertilizer. You could take regular generic, you know, garden tone generic fertilizer and just add a little bit more of uh, potassium and phosphorus and there you go you just elevated the potassium and phosphorus and decreased by weight or volume the amount of nitrogen so you just made your own bloom boosting um, fertilizer in that case which trellis are you going to use there um, I kind of gave everyone a tour of the different um, I have three different types of trellis um, systems here um, I'll show you really quick though um, and I have my trellis systems the decision on which kind to use is based on one second while I adjust this here what crop I'm planting obviously um, and the space or whatever so for my tomatoes this year I have two setups um, I've got I'm gonna call this cattle panel trellis but it's not actual cattle panels this was a roll of fencing because I can't fit cattle panel trellises in um, my car so this is a roll of fencing same idea just arch it up and zip tie it to some T-posts. And all my, all my trellis systems use T-posts. So then I'm going to be planting that very thin strip of soil you see there. Um, there. <laughs> I'm going to be planting my indeterminates there, tomatoes, so that they will grow on over. But this can support heavy things like lufa, tromboncino rapicante, uh, smaller squashes, watermelons, things like that, personal size uh, things. Um, all right, and then then <laughs> I really wish I had someone to help me with this because <laughs> um, I'm sure it looks kind of crazy. But the next system that I have here, I have these T posts here in a line. I'm going to string wire over the top, connect them all with just one piece of wire over the top. And then um, I'm going to use a hook and spool, tomato hook and spool type of system. And I have a YouTube video about that where I show you how I trellis them. Again, that's for the indeterminate tomatoes. Now for the determinants that I'm growing, they're shorter, bushier. I'm gonna do a Florida weave. So same thing. You have your um, T post, you put some string, you weave it in between your determinate plants and tie it off on the next T post, so to speak. Um, so this, this type of system, very specific, for tomatoes where I have it open like this either a wire over the uh, over the top or the tomato weave that this only works for the tomatoes this um, cattle panel trellis thingy works for a lot of different things um, the last 
well, I have two more, I guess. I actually, I guess I have four systems. Was this one right here. Again, they all use T-Post in some way. T-Post, um, electrical conduit pipe, some mesh vinyl trellis that I weave over this and I attach it with a PVC T-fitting. Um, you can use these kind or you can find the ones that are like an L shape. And I stick that on the end here, pop that on top of my T-post. This trellis system is super heavy duty. Again, supports the weight of heavy crops like lupa, trombolcino repicante, or smaller things like pole beans, cucumbers. I've grown everything on here. This is a great system. If you wanna find this same mesh vinyl trellis that I use, this stuff lasts years. Um, I have an Amazon link or I'll put it in the description below where you can find the same one because I, I've had different kinds. They deteriorate, they break. This is like a thicker um, plastic kind of material, lasts forever. And then the last um, type of trellising system is just getting some wood um, lattice material from like Home Depot, wherever. And there's another T-post. And I zip tied it onto the T-post. So just very simple, really easy. I can do it on my own. Um, I've got, um, this is some passion fruit that I have growing here. Different kinds of vines that I'll put on here. I've grown cucumbers, beans on it, like all kinds of things. So that's um, the three, four <laughs> different kinds of trellising systems that I am using this year. All right, guys. Um, so I think that's it. I've pretty much showed you guys the structures, the layout. Um, I will be planting all of this stuff up and I'll be meeting again in October with you guys. I, is anyone having any kind of issues you want to ask me real quick before we end with your gardens, your seedlings? If you've been joining my other um, classes prior to this, we started seeds together. You know, I'm kind of curious how's it going for you guys. Um, is it tall enough? The mesh system I showed you guys is adjustable height, um, depending on how tall of a T-post you can find. I have found 10 foot tall T-posts at Tractor Supply. I, I quite often find eight and seven. I personally like the taller ones. Um, these that I'm showing you here are the six foot ones. Once you pound them into the soil, you kind of lose half a foot or maybe one foot, so it drops down. But the taller, the better, in my opinion. Um, I just don't have any of the taller ones available right now. Um, you could still grow everything on it, but I do feel like when you have a taller system, there's more vertical space for your trellising plants to grow, which means they're going to produce more for you. They have more space. They're growing longer. They're going to produce more for you. I, I personally feel like my beans, my cucumbers, I get a lot more harvest from them the taller that structure is. So yeah, um, I've only ever found the 10 foot ones though at Tractor Supply, like definitely not my Home Depot or my Lowe's. Um, also, I'm having a Labor Day sale on my website right now. Um, I have seeds and plants available there. Um, it's a seed sale. And so if you need, wanna stock up on things, <clears throat> grow the same things that I grow here in my garden and the varieties and cultivars that I really love, you can find seeds on my website. That sale ends end of day tomorrow tomorrow's monday so take advantage of that um if you want to be updated on when the next class will be make sure you join my email newsletter that's pretty much how i alert everybody of the next you know class date and time um like i said i hope we can meet again in october when i plant um my brassicas and i'll have more things planted in here to kind of give you an update on what that looks like <clears throat> if you have any uh, questions for me that I, you know, you think of later or haven't been able to answer, um, the best way to get a hold of me is email. <laughs> I have, I'm on every social media thing you can think of. I get tons of messages. It's really hard for me to keep up with those. If you really want to be seen and have some kind of response, email is the best. And my email is info at jarasgarden.com. All right, so if you missed anything from this today, um, this is gonna upload right to my YouTube channel after we're done. Um, and in the description, I'll be putting in um, links and things that I discussed or stuff that I mentioned so you know where to find it. I also send a summary email um, 
through you know my email newsletter um, subscribers of this class and all that info as well some people ask for it so um, anyways I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your night thank you so much for taking out some time on your holiday weekend to uh, look at my garden and you know chat with me today um, so yeah I'll see you guys in the next class